to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ be sober be vigilant for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour the scriptures clearly teach that satan is a sly serpent genesis chapter 3 that he is a ravenous lion 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, and that he is an awe-inspiring dragon, Revelation chapter 12. And if we can understand how Satan works, what his nature is like, and what the scriptures tell us about overcoming the devil, then we can truly win the battle against the great enemy of old, Satan himself. Welcome to our study of knowing and overcoming the enemy, Satan. Satan wants you today and I can promise you he wants me to be lost and he wants us to go to hell and he is using everything inside his arsenal, his tools to make sure that we don't get to heaven. Now God is doing everything possible and has done everything possible to make sure that we do get to heaven but it also lies within each of us to overcome the devil and to choose to do what God says. Let's first notice as we think about knowing the enemy Satan, how the scripture describes this diabolical demon. The Bible gives several names to Satan himself. For example, in John chapter 8 and verse 44, Satan is described as the father of lies, a liar. Notice the words of John chapter 8, verse 44. The scripture says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Now notice, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. I can guarantee you today, if Satan is promising you wealth, if he is encouraging you to seek pride or pleasure in this life, and he sold that to you, I can guarantee you he sold it based on a lie. Throughout Bible history, a multitude of people have succumbed to the devil's lies. In Genesis chapter 3, Satan just took that one word out. God did not really say you die, did he? And because of their buying into the lie, Adam and Eve brought death, both physical and spiritual, to us. Satan throughout history has done this to mankind. And friend, he wants to lie to you, and he wants to lie to me, and he wants to tell us that it's not going to be that bad, that it really won't hurt us, and that a little sin here and there is just like a little white lie. Friend, we've got to realize one of his methods is that he is a liar. Not only is he a liar, he's the father of lies. He's the best liar you could ever imagine. Then in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24, another biblical term to describe Satan is the word Beelzebub. That is, prince of the devils. He is the chief, the lord, the leader of all the demons or all the devils that have ever existed. Imagine in your mind a band of murderous thieves a band of people who would go and hurt others and do ungodly things to them, and then imagine the fellow leading that. How horrible, how vindictive, how down to ungodliness he must be. That's the character of Satan. He is not just uh, one of the demons. He's the chief of the devils. He's the worst bad guy you could ever, ever imagine. And friend, you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to hang around people like that, would you? You wouldn't want to befriend people like that, would you? When you give in to Satan's tactics, 
You make him your best buddy. You make him your best friend in some ways. Another biblical term to describe Satan is that he is described as the God of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. That is the worldliness, the ungodliness, the sin that exists, the humanistic ideas that he has portrayed to so many. Satan's the one orchestrating that. Like a, a master in the orchestra, like the one conducting it. Satan is the puppet master, the God of this world, who is trying to get people to buy into worldliness and ungodliness. You see, Satan knows God is at enmity with the world and that Christians often are tempted to give in to that. The Bible says in James 4 verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore makes himself a friend of the world has become God's enemy. Satan is the God of this world. He wants us to give in to worldliness because he knows that separates a man from God. Another description of Satan in Scripture is that he is a murderer. John chapter 8 verse 44 says he was a murderer from the beginning. Think about people who have committed heinous crimes. Jeffrey Dahmer, others of that nature who've gone out and, and murdered multitudes of people. How do we view people like that? Well, we have a, a great disdain, ethically, socially, for people like that. We want those people to be locked in prison and to stay away from the general population. You see, Satan is the murderer. Genesis chapter 3, you've got the picture of Adam and Eve, and there they are in the, the luscious, wonderful, sin-free environment of the Garden of Eden. And here comes that slithering sly snake, the serpent, the devil himself, and he lies to them. He sells them a bill of goods that's not true. They eat of that forbidden fruit and murder. Death, both physical and spiritual, comes into existence. And from that point on, the gates were opened up. Romans 5 verse 12 tells us, through one man, sin entered into the world and death spread to all because all sinned. Adam flung open the gates and all of us have walked through that path because of our own sin. But Satan is the murderer. And friend, I can promise you today, he wants to destroy your soul. He wants more than anything for me and you to go to hell and to be lost and to never, ever be right with God. Oh, here's another illustration of Satan, another biblical name. He is described as that old serpent. Revelation chapter 20, verse 2, the serpent of old. Genesis chapter 3, that, that sly snake. He's the snake in the grass, if we can use that terminology. Imagine you're walking through the yard, and the grass is a little high, and there's a snake there, and he's right at your heels, and he just wants to bite and grab a hold of you and stick that venom in you. That's the picture of Satan. He's sly. He's deceptive. He lies in wait in a moment of weakness. He wants to cause me and cause you to give in to sin and to be lost. Another term that is used to describe Satan is that he is the adversary. I want you to notice the words of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. The scripture says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The word Satan itself means adversary. When Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, he wasn't identifying him as Satan in the flesh, but he was saying to Peter, you've taken an adversarial role. You're now playing the opponent, not on my side. How true it is that Satan is the arch enemy. He's the adversary of God. He's the adversary of righteousness. And he's our adversary today. And friend, we do not need to treat him like just a good old boy, like he's not that bad. We need to realize how diabolical Satan is. Another term, and this is probably one of the more popular terms used to describe Satan in Scripture, is the word devil. It is the Greek word diabolos. It occurs 38 times in the New Testament, and its literal root meaning is slanderer. Now, do you like to be around people who slander others, who've always got to tear people down, who've always got to be saying something bad about others to lift themselves up and to make their self look better? That's the kind of people we don't like to be around. Nobody wants to hang around others like that. They're unkind. They're abrasive usually. They're always in the objective case, in the kickative mood, if we can use that language. And Satan's like that. Satan is the slanderer of God. Did God really say 
Look at how he begins to slander God. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For God has said, he won't allow anything to happen to you. He slanders the word of God. He slanders righteousness. And by making sin look so appealing, he tries to slander the Christian life that has been set before us. But as we think about Satan, let's also today realize what Satan's goals are and how he works among men. Not only do I need to come to the scripture and see who Satan is, but I need to understand how is it that Satan's going to work and what is it he's trying to accomplish. One of Satan's main goals is to undo God's work, to undo the good, the righteousness, and the holiness that God has set before man. Notice the words of Mark chapter 4 and verse 15. The scripture says, And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes and immediately takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Here you've got the parable of the sower and he goes out and he sows that seed and it falls on four different soils and the ones by the wayside. Who is it that came and took that word out? Satan is there waiting to put something in its place and to extract that good word from their heart. If there's one thing Satan is surely trying to do today is to prevent evangelism from occurring. When we go out and preach the gospel, you can bet Satan is also preaching his method. He's doing things to cause people who've heard that word to not give in. And friend, I want to speak practically to you for a moment. If you've heard the word, and you know what the Word of God says, don't for a minute let Satan insert those buts or maybes or, well, this is what so-and-so said. That's Satan trying to undo the good work of the Word of God. You see, the power is in the Word of God. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says it's, it's living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's Word is trying to work on the heart of, man, of men and women today, but Satan is there picking it out and trying to replace it with something else. So know that Satan wants to undo the good work found through the Word of God. Well, that's, what's another one of Satan's goals? Satan wants to make men and women renounce God. Do you remember Job? Job was a blameless man, upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. But then a litany of bad things began to happen to Job. He loses his wealth. He loses his children. He loses his health. His wife tells him to curse God and die. And in Job chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, we learn... Satan wants men to renounce God. Satan says, in essence, you take away his health and he'll renounce it all. He'll renounce you. He'll renounce everything. That's exactly what Satan wants us to do today. When trials come into our life, when difficulties arise, when something happens and it brings me to my knees, what does Satan, Satan want me to do? He's wanting me to look up into heaven and say, God, why'd you let this happen? God, why are you bringing this into my life? You're to blame for this. And oftentimes people buy into that. But here's what we also need to realize. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. I know Satan wants to make men renounce God. Because in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, he tried that on our Lord and Savior Jesus. All these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. He took him up on the temple, the pinnacle of the temple. Uh, here are stones. Turn them into bread. Uh, throw yourself down. All this he wanted Jesus to do so that he would give himself to the devil. Satan is also trying to instigate evil among people today. In John chapter 13, verse 2, and in verse 27, we can see Satan working in the lives of men and women there in that context. They were trying to do the will of God, Jesus and the disciples, but Satan has crept in among them, and he's now instigating evil. He has one working on his side, and as a result, his plans are also coming to the front. Satan wants as well to secure men's worship. If there's one thing Satan wants of me and he wants of you, 
It's for us to worship him. Luke chapter 4 verses 6 through 8 and 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 through 4 teaches us that he wants to sit in that high seat. He wants to be the one who men and women look up to and he wants to have their worship. Now, are we saying today that Satan's trying to make us, that we're going to establish a, a church for Satan and that we're going to go to worship and worship Satan on the first day of the week? Satan knows. He's too sly to know that men and women won't necessarily do that. But here's how he gets us to worship him. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. When the kingdom becomes second or third or fourth in our life, guess who we're worshiping? We're worshiping this old world or we're worshiping what we want to do. And in essence, we're worshiping Satan. When we began to chase the almighty dollar, when our life is about how much money and how much stuff and how much things, how many things we can have in this life, then Satan has us right where he wants us. We're worshiping worldliness and we're worshiping Satan. And so he wants us to give him his worship. And we're not talking about going on the first day of the week to worship Satan, but by our lifestyle, by not putting the kingdom first. But ultimately, Satan wants men and he wants women to be lost. The Bible clearly teaches Satan's main goal is to cause people to burn and to writhe in the fires of hell forever. This is the kind of individual we're talking about. Imagine what hell's going to be like. A, a place where there'll be no weeping, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place of eternal torment, a place of fire, a place where a man just would beg for one drop of water. Can you imagine being in torment like that? That's the kind of person Satan is. He wants people to spend eternity in the fires of hell with him. How do we know that? Three passages clearly teach us. Job chapter 1, God is having a council there and the, the sons of God have come before God and Satan also comes and God says, in essence, where have you been? You remember Satan's answer? Going to and fro and back and forth on the earth. Well, what does that really mean? We learn by the very next statement. God says, have you considered my servant Job? What did it mean going to and fro and back and forth on the earth? He was looking, actively searching and looking for people to cause to be lost. 1 Peter 5 verse 8, he's a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour. Not physically, devour spiritually. And probably the clearest picture is seen in Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. Notice these words that Jesus said to Peter. And the Lord said... Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Look at what Satan's trying to do here. Peter wants to get out in front of the Lord. He wants to stop the Lord from dying and he doesn't want the, the Savior to go to the cross. And Jesus, in essence, said, Satan's taken over your heart. He's called, he wants you to be lost. Imagine the scene. Look at the illustration. It's as though you take wheat and you take chaff and you've got to sift it out. He wanted to sift men and women just like wheat and cast them out for nothing. That's the way Satan works, and those are his goals. Well, how is he going to do that? How is it that Satan is going to tempt, going to test Christians, and cause them to give in to these ungodly goals? Sometimes it isn't always as it seems. Sometimes Satan appears as an angel of light. Notice the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 11, the scripture says, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. He appears, he's got ministers, and they appear as angels of light, and we need not be ignorant of his devices. Sometimes they may come to us clean cut, nice haircut, fully dressed in a suit and tie, and they may say, Here's what you need to do. Or some teacher somewhere may say, you know, I know you've heard the Bible says this, but we live in this century now. That's 2,000 years ago. And can't you catch up to the times and do what everybody else is doing? Well, this is popular or this just makes us feel so good. And, and they look good and everything they're saying sounds so good. But it's the decep deception. It is the, the devil working through them, trying to cause men and women to be lost. How else is Satan going to accomplish these goals? Not only does he appear as an angel of light, Satan is simply going to try to create doubt in my heart and in yours. Remember Genesis 3, verse 1 following? Here's what Satan says. 
Did God really say such and such? You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did God really say that? You mean to tell me a loving God created you, put you in this garden, and then why is it he told you you couldn't have that? Did he really say that? Well, why did he say that? Does he not love you? You see, that's what Satan is trying to do in my heart and in yours. Well, if God loved you, why did he let that person close to you die? If God promised to take care of you, why did physical sickness come in your life? If, if God really loves you, why did he let you get involved in that sin? You see, friend, he wants to create doubt, and he wants to put all the blame on God, when in reality, we're free moral agents. We make our own choices, and some of those choices have good results, the good ones have good consequences, and the bad ones bad consequences. Here's the third way that Satan is going to try to get us to be lost, and that is he's going to misuse Scripture. He's going to take the Bible, the very Word of God, twist it, turn it, and make us think, well, you know, that might be right. Listen to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 6. Satan said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, are these passages straight out of the Bible? Absolutely they are. Satan took it right out of the Word of God and quoted it, had the audacity to quote it in the face of Jesus. They were right out of Scripture. What's the problem with that? Is the context of these passages suggesting or even hinting at the fact that if Jesus lives a careless life and jumps off the temple, God's going to take care of him? My goodness, no, that's not the context. That isn't even close to the context of either one of those passages, but Satan has made it sound like it was. Satan twisted it and took it and turned it and said, you know, this is what it says and I'm going to hold you to it. A lot of people today are twisting the scriptures and Satan is working through them. All you've got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus. The Bible says you've got to believe. John chapter 8, verse 24. Well, there's no doubt you've got to believe. But where's the passage that says, all you've got to do is believe. James 2.24 says that a man is not justified by faith alone, but taking those passages out of context is one of the ways Satan is going to misuse Scripture against us and try to get us to be lost. Well, another way Satan works is through his many wiles or his many methods. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 again says he has a arsenal. He has many tactics. 1 Timothy 3 verse 7, he is a wily and conniving individual. He's always got something working in the background. Often think of when we use the word, uh, the wiles of the devil, I think of the old Acme cartoon where you've got the roadrunner and you've got Wiley Coyote. And that roadrunner is always escaping. And, but Wiley Coyote, he's always got some Acme product in the background, in the works, trying to catch that roadrunner. It may not work this time, but he goes on to the next one. You see, that's how Satan is, except his are a lot more proficient than wily coyotes. And so when we think about the wiles of the devil, remember, he's in the background working and he's trying, actively trying to thwart our good for God and to cause us to do wrong. Well, Satan also will afflict believers. Luke chapter 13, verse 16, and the book of Job teaches us that some of the things that happen to people do happen at the hand of Satan. Why is it Job lost his wealth why is it Job lost his family? And why is it Job lost his health? Satan was the puppet master, the orchestrator behind all of that. Sometimes Satan does cause us to be afflicted to get us to lose faith in God and to give up. Satan also is going to tempt us in any way he can to overcome our good and to cause us to ultimately be lost. Well, let's think about this then. If Satan is a diabolical demon, if he has the ultimate goal of wanting me and you to be lost, and if he is in the background orchestrating the best way possible to do that, how am I going to overcome him? Here's the good news. You can overcome the devil and you can win the battle every time. How so? Number one, by putting on the Christian armor. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 6, verses 10 through 17, that we're to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. If we'll put on the breastplate of righteousness, take up the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, all these things that God's given us, we can overcome. How else can I overcome? 
by my faith. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9 says, Resist him steadfast in the faith, and he will flee from you. We can defeat the devil by overcoming him with our trust in God, our faith in the word of God, and knowing that God will help us. And the good news again is you can and you must overcome the devil. I want you to notice a beautiful passage that gives every child of God great hope. It's found in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Notice these words. The Bible says, And they, Christians, overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. They had the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb. They had the word of their testimony, which we now have as Scripture, and then they did not love their lives unto the death. They had self-sacrifice. Sacrifice of Christ, Scripture, and self-sacrifice is how I can be sure. There's a threefold method, foolproof method, by which we can overcome Satan. Friend, is Satan wreaking havoc in your life and in mine? Has Satan been living in us, working in us, and causing us to be lost? You can be sure today, he is doing everything possible to get me and to get you to give up on God and to lose our salvation. And ultimately, he wants us to spend eternity in hell, in the fire and pain of hell with him. Don't let Satan do that to you. If you've never obeyed the gospel, more than anything, you need to start winning the battle against Satan by becoming a Christian. What must a person do to become a Christian? The Bible teaches you first have to Hear the word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Having heard that word, having recognized this is the power unto salvation, you then must believe that Jesus is God's son. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, 24. Having believed, you must repent. You must turn from sin, from Satan, and turn to God. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. You must make that good confession. Romans 10, verse 10, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. Peter preached it this way. On the very first gospel sermon, Peter told men and women, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, for for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Maybe Satan's been living in you as a Christian. You also need to repent and make that right. But listen carefully today. Don't let the devil have his way with you. Put your trust in the gospel, and you can and must overcome the devil. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.